Hello, everyone, and welcome to Innovation Coffee, brought to you by ARM. My name is Robert Wolf, your host today and every Thursday at 5 p.m. UTC. I got to check, make sure I'm not muted. I was like, oh, I just gave this whole spiel of muted. Um, gosh, every time I look at that intro splash that we have, I, I see myself with a short beard, looking all young back when we first started this show. Uh, gosh, how far we've come doing these live streams it's it's really nice and with that today we are joined by an amazing guest um chasm chasm spelt k-a-s-m today to learn all about containers and of course what chasm does with containers so we are joined today by let me pull up my list here of everything we're going to cover today we're joined by matt mccloskey who is the cto and co-founder of chasm and we're going to show you what it is. We're going to show some demos. We have some cool stuff at the end of the episode to show some demos on. And we'll cover uh, a lot of the cool stuff that Chasm's been up to with ARM and in the ecosystem, in the ARM ecosystem. So I think uh, uh, one other thing I'd like to say is that, um, you know, uh, last week um, it was a fun episode as well um, where we went over – I want to pull up. I want to pull up last week's episode if we if we can share that as well, real quick. So let me let me just pull this up real quick, and we can talk about that for just a minute. And then also, I do want to talk about um, the the uh, the next week's episode as well. So uh, last week's episode, we talked about uh, Dev Board Farms and all about this particular uh, board farm called All Hardware. Now, if you want to go watch that episode, we'll share it in the comments area or here. There, Oh, right there. How about that? So last week's episode right there. Don't go clicking it right now. But after the episode, if you have an extra hour to spare, or you want to poke around that episode, feel free to go check it out. It was a lot of fun. And um, you can also get access. I think there's a code in there to get access to their hardware as well. So, um, you know, if you want to go explore all hardware and their board farms, you can go get access to a code and you can go start developing on that next week. Um, I'll reiterate on this at the end of the episode, but right now, if you aren't aware, um, MWC is happening over in Barcelona. And so, uh, if you're at MWC, I hope you're having a fun and very safe time over there. I know that it's a really cool conference and I wish I was there. Um, but, uh, next week, we're going to be covering the whole conference. So, you know, a kind of a, a post-event rundown of what went on over there. And once again, we'll be joined by Dara. And that just kind of makes me think about actually last week. <laughs> last week, it wasn't all hardware. Last week was Dara with Parsec. And the week before was all hardware. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit lost here. But yeah, so um, if you if you uh, missed last week, we spoke with Dara and Mark Minier actually about Parsec, which is the platform abstraction for security and previously all hardware. So go check out both episodes actually. Got two hours to spare. Go check out both episodes in the past and, uh, and, and get back to me next week when we're talking about MWC. Once again with Dara Graylish of 56K Cloud. All right. So there's my rant. Um, again, once again, today we're joined by Matt McClaskey from Chasm CTO and co-founder. Let's bring Matt into the call. We want to learn all about containers and what Chasm does with containers. Welcome, Matt. How are you? Good. Uh, thanks for having me, Robert. Excellent. Yes. No, thank you for joining. We got some good comments rolling in here. Hello from Good Noob. Hi there from Bruno. We got uh, Good Morning, everyone, from Hybrid Robotics, also known as Hybonics. Um, and so we're ready to kind of cover this, get going. Now, usually, Matt, what we do at the beginning of these episodes, we want to get to know you, who you are, what you do. Let's uh, let's talk about your origin story. Who is Matt? Sure. So um, as you said, I'm the CTO and co-founder of Chasm, um, along with Justin Travis. He's the other co-founder. Uh, we both started this journey about five years ago, uh, and we both came from the same background. So we're, so we're both from the DOD uh, Defense Department. Um, and the intelligence community. Uh, we've both been developing software um, in those arenas in both offensive and defensive capacities um, for most of our career. Um, and the, the concept of Chasm uh, initially started as uh, a purely cybersecurity tool. Uh, for our jobs, we needed to do research on the internet, on exploits and vulnerabilities, and, and kind of the shady, the, the shady uh, CD corners of the internet that um, aren't really safe to do from your own computer. Uh, so we wanted a way to be able to do that. And eventually we stumbled upon uh, Docker. And we thought, hmm, that seems like a pretty cool tech. 
uh, let's see if we can containerize Chrome and um, uh, stream that containerized Chrome to our own browsers. And that way we're just kind of interacting with a rendering and, of something that we can easily destroy and, and recreate and not leave any kind of fingerprints or um, uh, limit the, uh, our um, exposure to the internet. Um, but what we actually ended up developing was like so much greater uh, and, and encompasses so much more than that. We created this entire platform um, uh, for orchestrating and streaming containers, UI-based containers. Um, kind of our first start was um, in the DoD on a pilot program. Um, so this DoD organization was developing machine learning for the DoD, and they needed to partner with um, with the industry. So startups, Fortune 100 companies, universities, all working together uh, to bring the best of machine learning to the DoD. And they needed a way to, to provide access to those developers um, that are remote and on their own systems without exposing the DoD systems or allowing DoD data to get out. And so that's kind of um, the niche that, that Chasm plays is that we're able to put this separation between the users and the systems that they're accessing which is where the word chasm comes from. Um, about a year ago, we went full on public um, as a general container streaming platform. And we've enjoyed a lot of success, success in being a platform that empowers other people. So that's kind of the quick and dirty on the founders and, and how we got to where we are today. Very nice, very nice. Yeah, so um, it's good to see. Uh, I know that we have a lot of container lovers uh, that join this call. There you go, Bruno, you know, containers in arm, what's not to love? Um, we've had Jason Andrews join the call talking about containers and multi-arc and multi-platform use cases. Uh, so um, definitely love covering containers and Docker on, on, on these live streams. So it's, it's good to have you here talking about a pretty amazing use case, what you built out of this. So you kind of covered a little bit about Chasm. Um, I want to dive now. This is we're, we're just going to skip some of these icebreaker rounds. Sometimes we do like a what were you thinking or what's on your desk. We're going to skip those this time. I understand you're in a, uh, in, a in a transient office, so it's not going to work. <laughs> yeah, all right. That's all right. So we're going to dive right into the main segment, and we're going to intro today's topic, Chasm. As you mentioned, kind of like play on the word Chasm, right, where you're kind of bridging this, this gap, right? And now you kind of covered a bit of what Chasm is, but maybe you can just kind of give this, again, short, simple explanation of what the platform is, what it does. Let's cover that bird's eye view real quick. Mm -hmm. So simply put, Chasm is a container streaming platform. Um, so it handles everything from uh, orchestrating containers, orchestrating the compute that powers the containers, um, session handling for users, logging them in, enterprise logging, web filtering, data loss prevention, and of course, the streaming tech that, that streams these UIs that are running in the container and streams them to the end user's browser. Um, so we kind of handle every, a, a lot of things. Okay, so building containers and then taking those containers and streaming those containers onto a browser, right? This, this exactly. Yeah. Pretty good. Okay, cool, perfect, there you go. Now. Looking at, at some general use cases. Now, I was exploring your website. I noticed you kind of had these three buckets, these kind of major use cases that people are, are, are encouraged to or, you know, have found the best uses for Chasm. Could you kind of talk about these three use cases and maybe just go a little bit deeper into each one of these? Sure. So there, there are a lot of use cases for Chasm, but the kind of the, the three main ones are uh, VDI, which is virtual desktop infrastructure. Uh, think like remote work. Uh, being able to just open a desktop in your browser and that desktop is actually running in your work environment and being streamed to your, your local browser. And that's really helpful for this remote work culture that we're in where um, enterprises need to be able to have these like remote desktops that they can ensure that the users can connect to and they're not opening up their, their network to vulnerabilities or uh, what have you on, on the end user's computer. Um, the next big one is... Um, Browser isolation. I kind of went out of order on our website. That you guys that's all right. Up, but, uh, uh, browser isolation. That's kind of how we got started. Um, just the, this idea that you could have this browser that's running anywhere. Um, and actually, we uh, have our SaaS, uh, the personal edition, where you can you can spin up a, a browser in multiple regions around the world, wherever you want. 
and um, a stream to your local browser. And so you're, you can be absolutely sure that whatever you do in that browser is not transient. Um, it, you can't be fingerprinted uh, and you know, it's safe. And it's, once you're done, it's destroyed and like completely destroyed and fresh every time you want a new one. Um, and then the, the final use case is just general app streaming, uh, which is, you know, streaming any kind of app uh, that you want to an end user. Uh, and in the example, we have a, uh, there's a Word document. Yeah, I really like the so so the browser use case, right? I, I'm thinking about it and how I use browsers, right? So you know, if I'm using Chrome, like for example, I have different emails logged in, right? And so kind of everything I do on that browser when I'm logged into that user profile is saved to that user profile. And I could have my bookmarks. In fact, you can see like this is my personal one here. And you can see I have all my bookmarks, my little widgets up here and all that kind of stuff. Um, but every now and then, uh, you know, something either gets saved to it or something doesn't get saved to it. And, and so I'm kind of trying to take a, a grasp a little bit more what these, uh, what these containerized browsers, uh, would do. So is it kind of like a, is it kind of like a customized personalized browser, but like almost like a private browser, like you said, it can be destroyed afterwards. So you can access it anywhere and then just destroy it. And so what I'm, I'm, I'm kind of wondering like, what would be the reasons for, for this? So think of the, why, why people use VPNs, for example, um, they, yeah, mine wanna, on right now. <laughs> uh, they, they like Nord VPN or something like that. They want to, they want to hide um, what they're doing from someone. Like maybe their ISP, they don't like their ISP knowing where they go. Um, which they can by uh, DNS queries and, and such, um, or they don't want um, the sites that they visit to be able to track them and know who they are. But the, the problem with the VPN is it really only obscures your public IP. Um, they can still fingerprint you because your, your host is directly connecting to these websites. So if you connect to my web server, um, I can fingerprint you. I can put cookies in there. I can do all kinds of things. Um, but with, but with Chasm, you're completely separated. Your local computer has absolutely no connection um, to the end web server. You're only getting a rendering of that. So there's no way malware can come through that. There's, um, there's no way that people can track you from one session to the, ne the next session. So it's just kind of like the, the ultimate privacy and security uh, on the internet. So th this actually now, okay, now that you bring this up, this, this, this makes me now want to start diving a little deeper into this and we could just use this as an example. Um, now are these is chasm and I haven't dove deep enough. That's why we have you here so I can learn. <laughs> but so can I set chasm up on like a raspberry Pi? Can I have like a little micro node running chasm and then I could use my host machine, like my big old beefy desktop to call on a browser container in my raspberry pi or is this are, are all these services run on like your servers or how does how does this work Did i build this so, myself yeah chasm can run in uh uh in the cloud uh we support a number of cloud providers um or can run on premise to include a raspberry pi uh, once we added uh, arm support um we had a, a lot of people in the community um demanding pi support and so we now run uh, as long as you've got a, a an arm 64 uh Pi with uh, an appropriate operating system, it will work. Excellent. I just realized that I'm sharing my screen and poking through <laughs> uh, the the document here. All right, cool. So we talked about kind of the three uh, the the three kind of main use cases. Now, if possible, can you talk about any uh, outside products or people or things that have been using Chasm that you know we might be able to kind of relate to? Like I was trying to kind of create a personal example of, okay, well, I'm going to get Chasm running on a Raspberry Pi, and then I'm going <clears> to <throat> tap into Chasm through my desktop and stream a browser, right? Now, mm -hmm. um, what, what, are some, what are some use cases that people have been using this for uh, that we can kind of relate to? Sure. Um, so as I've said, it, we're more, we like to think of ourselves as, as a platform that powers other people. So some of the things that um, we've actually had more than one startup come to us and, and want to use us to power um, their, their SaaS, which was to enable people to all walk, come together and watch a movie together. Um, 
And while we could technically do that for le for legal reasons, we kind of wanted the the shy away from that. Um, but some other some other use cases: uh, um, open source intelligence research, uh, which which would be law enforcement, DOD, or other government agencies that need to do open source uh, intelligence research and collection. Um, that's one. Uh, we are working with a Silicon Valley uh, Sequoia-backed startup that is using Chasm. Um, I can't really go into detail on that, but um, just imagine a, everybody everybody being able to share a single application and use it and interact with it at the same time. Um, and they're they're going public, full public here pretty soon, so we're excited for that. So um, so it kind of feels like so so there are platforms out there that kind of offer experiences like this, right? So like you have Google Docs, right? But Google Docs is this centralized entity. You have things like uh, Miro, Miro board, where you go in and you open this big kind of brainstorming whiteboard and you all go in there and you can put stuff into it. So this kind of allows people to kind of build their own containerized versions of whatever they want. And this is more private. You're not trusting some external company with your data. You're not giving anything to anyone else. You're building it yourself and putting it for your own company, building it for yourself. There, am I right on that, or, or, I mean, yeah. If you wanted to use it in that way, you definitely could. Um, okay, you could cool. Create your own um, uh, SaaS for your private SaaS for your company or service for your company that, um, for any for any purpose, such as um, for multi-user um, collaboration with data. Excellent. Yeah. So, so uh, some questions have come in here, and I'm I'm glad that they have because these are questions that I feel like I should have come up with, but. Um, Charlie J is asking, I'm sorry if this has been covered. It hasn't. Um, but what lat latency would a user experience when using Chasm? I'd imagine it's different depending on what the workload is. But, um, you know, maybe you can talk about some of this latency. I guess you wouldn't want to see too much if you're just like browsing the Internet on a browser uh, container. But yeah, so for our for our SaaS, the ones that we operate, we use um, uh you have the option to have the, the containerized browser launched closest to you. Like we detect and like, where are you? And then we, we make sure that we deploy the, that container as close to you as possible. And so the latency and user experience is very good. And when we do that, it's, it's, you know, it's perfect. But when you are in, let's say California and you tell it, no, no, I want you to create the container in India. Well, we can do that. Um, uh, oh, Justin is, Hopefully I got that right, that we have a region in India. Uh, but uh, when you do that, that's obviously that's going to be a lot of latency. Um, that's got to stream all the way from India to California. Uh, so, so you but you do offer these nodes or you offer these nodes yourself. So you can you can get a node hosted through Chasm and you can choose where you want the server location. So you have multiple servers set up around the world. So our personal uh, our personal cloud version is, is very simple. You basically log in and say, I want to create a. Uh, a, a browser or I want to create a desktop and you have an option to tell it where you want it created, just oh, automatic okay. or a specific location. You have anything near San Diego? <laughs> I think we do have a U.S. West. Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, there you go. Awesome. So uh, Charlie, I hope that answers your question. Um, it seems that there are servers all over the place. Now, I would imagine that if you set up your own node in your location and you built it yourself or, you know, you hosted, you went on and made your AWS account and got yourself a Graviton instance and set it up on the U S West or wherever you're located. I'd imagine you can also find ways to reduce those latency. Um, right. If, any if latency. you're in the same, if you're in the same, let's say time zone, uh, you're going to have a good experience. Yeah. Okay, cool. So that covers that question. The next question is from David W and it wouldn't be a question from David W if, if there weren't drones involved. Um, so uh, has chasm been used to stream containers to mobile devices uh, such as robots or drones, possibly fleets. Um, I'm trying to think of the use case where you would stream something to the robot. Um, we have had people reach out to us um, for for a drone software to be able to stream it. Basically, be, they wanted to be able to control the drone, um, but it had a thick client. They wanted to be able to do it from a tablet. So basically have Chasm in the middle to be able to stream that thick client to a tablet. Uh, that was, you know, could be anywhere. Um, so 
That's the only thing I can think of offhand. What about like auto destruct, where like if the drone is compromised and 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 it lands in enemy territory, and you need that, you need everything on the drone to not be there anymore. It's just it's just streaming it, right? So wouldn't it, if if the drone got compromised, then they couldn't get the the software off of it. I don't know. <laughs> probably probably a d- dumb thing I just said. Um, but yeah, there you go, David. Maybe you could be the first one to stream some uh, some containers using Chasm to a drone. That'd be interesting to showcase on the show if you want to try that out. Um, let's see. So would I be streaming a browser from another location to my location? I think we kind of answered this. So it depends on where you set up set up from, right? Where you where you build your. Right? Yeah, you're basically you're streaming um, you're sh- streaming a remote browser to your local one, um, and it's all kind of seamless. Uh, so hopefully you don't you don't really feel like it's a rendering. Um, you kind of, we we hope that it's more of a native experience and it just feels like you're interacting with the web page directly. Okay, excellent. Um, and then hybrid robotics said, could I selectively allow someone to access my robot? Um, or I guess let's just use general use case. Could you selectively allow someone to access your browser or application? Yeah. So Chasm um, handles. Uh, Authentication uh, policies, you can apply a bunch of like different security policies and um, you can basically by group membership, you can dictate who has access to which images and who can create ones. You can even even uh, do uh, shared sessions and bring other people into a shared session. Perfect. <clears throat> there you go. And it uh, looks like you have a new customer uh, or developer in the in the audience. So I'll be looking at Charlie says I'll be looking at spinning up a chasm container on my home lab tonight. This is pretty cool. Excellent. Thank you for the kind words there. Awesome. Um, so uh, let's dive in now to kind of the collaboration aspects that maybe you have experienced between ARM and CHASM. Um, I'm generally interested in this, you know, like, uh, you know, I was told by Jason Andrews, you all know Jason Andrews. He's joined us in several episodes in the past talking about Docker and multi-arc, multi-platform stuff. Um, now, um, tell tell me a little bit about you know, how, how have you worked with ARM, you know, in the last months or years or whatever? And, you know, what, what kind of support have we offered? What stuff have, have we done together? I, yeah, I, I personally have not done anything with you. Right. So I'm wondering what some of my colleagues and the ecosystem has done to support this effort. Yeah. So, uh, Jason originally reached out to us. Um, oh, I don't know if this maybe six months ago or so by now, but, um, um, he wanted to know if there's, a, if we could bring chasm BNC, so Chasm VNC is an open source project that we maintain. It provides the, the rendering tech um, behind our platform. Um, and he wanted to see if we could provide a, uh, an ARM build and what ARM could do to help facilitate that. Um, so we were, we were very intrigued by the offer and we're like, let's do it. Um, and within a week we had an ARM build. Um, but we didn't, we weren't able to do everything. So we had, uh, we've done a lot of work in, in Chasm VNC and making it modern, um, and, and part of that was adding optimizations for like SSE2 and um, other optimizations for the Intel processors. So we needed to kind of port those over, um, and so uh, Jason and team helped us out with that, um, which was actually, for those that are interested, relatively easy um, thanks to the, the SSE2 Neon library. Um, it was basically just a couple of compiler directives, a header file, and a few small changes to the build. And um, all of a sudden, we had a, a, an ARM optimized build, uh, which was very cool. Um, after that, we, we moved on to make the entire platform run on ARM. And so we, we publish a lot of uh, what we call workspace images. So we talked about browsers, but we have all kinds of different apps that that the platform can run. So we've got things like Slack, Teams, Visual Studio Code, um, all these different apps that you can run individually. And so we ported it over, we made as many of those Docker files, which by the way, are all on Docker Hub uh, and open source on GitHub. Um, we ported as many of those over to ARM. So they're multi-architecture. Um, so you can run those on Raspberry Pi if you wanted to. Um, and cool. then lastly, um, we are, we did work with uh, Virtual GL. Um, now that wasn't with ARM, but um, uh, we funded uh, the addition of EGL backend uh, to Virtual GL, and then also making Virtual GL uh, builds for ARM. Uh, so 
what that provides is the ability to run uh, GPU accelerated UI containers, uh, which I'm going to show off later. Nice. During the demo phase. That's right. <laughs> cool. And so th this, this brings up, I think, uh, you know, you and I were talking in the green room. I think there is a nice segue into a contest that happened last year. I think it was like the middle to our latter end of last year, uh, the Graviton Challenge by AWS. And this is kind of, I think, how we came to meet each other here is because Jason Andrews, I think, told you about this contest. You went and participated in it. And to just kind of give you all a little bit of an understanding of what this contest was, it was a contest run by AWS uh, that tried to get people, developers, to port projects from another architecture onto ARM, right? So uh, onto the Graviton more specifically. So get your project running on the Graviton. Um, and the Graviton is a Neoverse N1 or N2 now based uh, chipset that uh, is in the server space. So this is really cool. Um, and uh, I think this is something that I would love to hear about because you're the first AWS uh, Graviton challenge contestant or participant that has been on this show. So if you could, I, I really love to kind of cover this, right? You know, we hear about developer contests quite often, hackathons and things that developers can go participate in to either meet people, network, build things, earn prizes. So maybe if you could um, tell us like, you know, what's the good, the bad and the ugly that has come out of this particular challenge that you participated in? Sure, so uh, Jason, turned us on to that contest. And we only had like, it was a, maybe a week um, to, to get involved in that. And so we uh, pressed forward as fast as we could. We got our, our, um, our video, we had to create a video and a, a paper together and we got it submitted just in time. Um, and we actually, we ended up winning. And it was, uh, for me, it was a, it was a great um, experience. Uh, it really was. Uh, AWS flew us out or flew me out to Vegas for a week, put me in a very nice hotel. Um, we got to meet folks from the AWS Graviton team and the RM team. Uh, the, the, the event was very well orchestrated. Um, now it was about half the size of normal, I think 30,000 people, but still it was a very well oiled um, event. Um, so, Kind of the, the good uh, from my from my viewpoint, uh, you know, startups are really the the innovation drivers of the tech sector, and I think these types of events really invigorate uh, startups. Um, I think the AWS contest was was fair, um, and you know, like I said, very well organized. So it's def definitely a good experience for us. That's awesome. Yes, good to know. Yeah. So. Um... <clears throat> I was just pulling it up there. You know, I pulled that up. Don't copy the link or anything. It's expired. You can, you can, you can go, or the link isn't, but the, the challenge is it ended on in October of last year. But um, I hope that, you know, AWS companies like this start hosting more contests like this. Uh, it's really important to see developers kind of coming together or bringing their projects and showcasing them on, uh, on ARM-based systems, if anything, porting them over and increasing their reach by adding in an ARM, the ARM ecosystem into the into the fold. So, um, allowing people, like for example, like my first question was, can I get Chasm up on a Raspberry Pi or ARM-based platform like one of these I have here? And so, getting those things uh, enabled for for developers like that, I think, is important. So. I guess one last thing I'd like to brainstorm with you before we switch topics here uh, from the Graviton challenge is, I guess, is there anything that, that you might say, or if, if ARM, like let's just say ARM were to host a contest like this. I know we are actually in the workings of trying to get something like this going. If we were to host a contest like this, is there anything in particular you would like to see? And I mean by like, you as, as, uh, as a, you, you, owe, you have a startup going, you have your own company, uh, you, you might not need prizes like, like oh, we're going to send you a Raspberry Pi for you and your team if you win. Like, that's not stuff that might interest you. But what are some of the things that might interest you when you when you look at these contests? What motivates you to get involved as a developer? Yeah, I think as a, um, as a startup, uh, one thing that really motivates us is visibility. Um, a chance to get your name out there, a chance to do um, uh, co-press releases. Um, attend events such as this one um, and 
you know, that, that kind of visibility is, is key, I think, for a startup and, and kind of the motivator uh, or one of the motivators. Um, but just adding support for ARM in and of itself, I think, is a huge motivator. Being able to, to gain access to, there are a lot of Raspberry Pi uh, fans out there, um, and they're very vocal. <laughs> <laughs> so you know the kind of joke but um you know in all seriousness uh, there's a lot of um it opens you up to a, a whole another crowd that can can use your platform um so i think anybody would be motivated to um, any startup would be motivated to um, for that kind of contest i like that i like the the visibility um that was a very sh straight concise answer on on what you'd be looking for as well as you know of course enablement and, and, and audience um sorry real quick i want to answer this question is that new el gato gear uh uh behind you and yes maybe you noticed this right here these boxes stacked up so these these boxes here are more of these sound panels uh, i'm thinking about outlining the garage doors here uh, and adding some more to the wall, but this is also my Elgato microphone and I have an Elgato camera and I have Elgato lights. Oh yeah. Maybe you saw these too. Those are also the Elgato lights. Um, so yeah, I'll be outfitting this, this, uh, up a little bit better, um, in, in the, in the future. And this is also right here. This is my bottle of Tapatio that ended up on, on, a <laughs> on the table, uh, that I forgot to move. So yeah, cool. Um, anyways, Matt, back to the, 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 the point here. Now you bring up, um, chasm uh, and, and sorry, you didn't bring this up, but another question came up in the chat here, uh, by hybrid robotics. Uh, if I have chasm self-hosted container on a robot, would I be paying per session accessing that? And this is something that I actually really wanted to bring up. And I think it's a segue into the next topic here, which is how do developers get started? And I'd love to, during this particular section, kind of talk about your pricing model. Because if you go to chasmweb.com, you'll see that there are several pricing models. So maybe we can talk about how do developers get started, address hybrid robotics question, and then talk about these these pricing models and how developers might be able to utilize these to the process of their development. Sure. So uh, off the top first, there's either self-hosted or, or SaaS. Obviously, if it's a SaaS or cloud, um, there's compute that we have to pay for. Uh, so that, that changes the whole structure. But starting with self-hosted, self uh, we have the community edition, uh, which is free. Uh, so that's free for personal, uh, non-commercial use. Um, and it supports up to five concurrent sessions. So what that means is you can have as many users defined as you want, um, but you can only have um, five concurrent um, containers running, uh, UI-based containers running. Uh, and com the community edition really has most of the features um, that the Chasm has. There, there are a few exceptions, uh, which I'll get to in the demo. Uh, but by and large, it, it's got everything. Um, then there's the uh, professional edition. So if you wanted to use Chasm for, uh, if you wanted to go either go beyond that five concurrent session um, or needed to use it for commercial use uh, for your company, then this is where you would go. Uh, now, this, this is where you get in the per user or per concurrent session. You'll see that, that box or that, that tick up in the, the upper right. Uh, so right now it's on per user. And so what that means, that's is, that's per named user. Uh, now, it really depends on your use cases. Some some people, they'll have, you know, thousands of users, but maybe only uh, 10 at a time right, throughout the day would use it at a time. So it, for them, it makes more sense to do concurrent sessions. So what is the high level watermark of how many sessions you want to be able to support concurrently? Um, but then... Other folks, they, they have a lot of users um, and most of them will be on the system all at once. Uh, let's say for like remote working, if everybody's remote, um, then it makes more sense to, to use the per user option. And you'll see it's, it's basically double the cost. Well, it just, you have to do the math on your own to figure out which, which is better for you. Um, awesome. And then back to the tiers, the enterprise is really, um, getting more into the, the custom custom deployment type stuff. So do you want to be able to 
have it on premise and in the cloud and do cloud scaling? Do you want to um, have the developer API to be able to do anything you want? Um, do you want uh, custom branding, um, custom uh, or um, staging and casting? Those are kind of some of the features that I'll go over. Okay, cool. And this, yeah, this is the stuff you'll go over in in the demo, which I think we're almost there on. Um, <clears throat> now, talking about developers, how developers get started. So we did talk about now the pricing tiers. You have an open source story that that uh, I've been wanting to hear about. We moved it to this segment here. So so what's the open source story, and and how can developers get started with uh, with Chasm? Sure. So the the platform the the full platform itself is an all open source, but there, the major components of it are um, the the main component and the one that's that's kind of my baby is Chasm VNC. Uh, so when we started this journey, we we originally started with an open source uh, VNC project. I won't name it, but it became very clear quickly that we couldn't we couldn't contribute to it in any meaningful way, and we really wanted to take um, Chasm VNC into the current century, which meant breaking the RFB spec. Uh, with RFB spec is what VNC, uh, VNC conforms to, um, and making it web native and all these things we wanted to do, and we just we had to make our own uh, to do it, and that is all open source. Um, and then the the next thing is all of our workspace images. They're all open source. So I talked about we have a Teams. Uh, image, a Microsoft Teams image, a, a Slack, all these different images, full desktops, um, they're all open source. Um, and then, like I said, of course, the, the full platform, we have a, the uh, community edition. Lucky I was muted there. <coughs> <laughs> Took a big drink of water. Okay, so that's really cool. Um, I think that covers it. And I think that you know, with the amount of time we have left right now, the best way to explain all of this is probably with a demo because you got a demo ready for us and we can kind of see all of this in action. So I'm really excited. Um, we rehearsed sharing the screen in the green room before the show. <coughs> have to cough that out a little bit. So I'm going to hand it over to you. Um, I want to remind everyone that while you're watching, if you have any questions for Matt or Matt, Matt or myself, um, feel free to toss those in the chat. We've been answering them as they come up, you know, uh, during the demo, I'll try to reduce the amount of times I interrupt you. But, um, if a question comes up, we'll bring that to the floor. Um, so, uh, Matt, let's get this demo started. What, what, what can, what does chasm have to offer here? Let's see it. All right. Awesome. So first and foremost, let me say that, uh, you'll see this big arm thing here. This is, this is not arm. This is chasm. I'm showing off our, our custom branding. Uh, so I wanted to show how easy it is for you to take Chasm and do whatever you want with it. Um, I did not have permission to do that. Hopefully that's okay. It's fine. It's fine. Yeah. As it, as in arm, arm didn't, arm didn't buy this. We didn't build this. They built, they built this for the demo, which is cool. Right. That's cool. Arms logo. Awesome. <laughs> so uh, just to show how I did that real quick under branding, it's a very simple config. And by the way, you can set this per domain. So um, you could have as many host names as you want pointed at the server and it'll use a different branding for whatever host name you want. Um, and it's, it's really simple. Um, just telling it what image to use for the, for the favorite icon, what image to use for the, the login screen um, and different descriptions to use. Now to, to get into to more of what the, what the end user would see um, this is what an end user would see when they log in. And I've got three images uh, shown here. So I got a Chromium based image. Um, I have a focal GPU and a Ubuntu ML desktop. So this, this desktop is open source. It's on GitHub. Uh, it is geared towards machine learning. And uh, I just, or we just added um, support for ARM. Uh, so it's now a, a multi-architecture build as well. So here you, you'll see I have uh, persistent profiles enabled, uh, which means um, basically what it says, the, the home directory of the desktop will persist between sessions. And now, and now it won't. You disabled I disabled it. it. <laughs> I disabled it, yeah. yeah. So it wipes it, it wipes it clean. It just destroys the container at the end, basically. 
Yeah, yeah. Nothing I do here will will persist um, to the next session. Excellent. Uh, so you see here, you can see it's got loaded a bunch of development tools, um, PyCharm, um, uh, Jupyter Notebook, Visual Studio, uh, to name a few. It does have an Anaconda environment with a whole bunch of uh, ML uh, libraries loaded. Uh, and for this instance, you can see that I do have full hardware acceleration, a GPU acceleration with the uh, NVIDIA T4 GPU. This is running in AWS on the Graviton2 uh, with the uh, NVIDIA GPU. And I'm going to go. Uh, oh, I don't have my uh, I don't have my favorites because I didn't load the profile. Uh, this is demo a demo nightmare. I was just supposed right. to, I was just supposed to click the button. <laughs> I used to have six cats. I stopped sacrificing them before demos. So I'm left with, <laughs> <laughs> I have three now. <clears throat> just kidding. I just kidding. I, I don't sacrifice cats. Cool. So we're looking at a game here. The game is running inside your instance, your container uh, that you loaded up through Chasm. Yeah. And uh, it's, well, this wasn't the game. The other one just played instantly, but uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's really that simple. You'll saw that you saw, you saw that the container just launched instantly. It's not like a Citrix workstation or something where uh, there's just, you know, a couple minute lead time, uh, before you get a desktop, everything's pretty instant uh, and responsive. Whoa, whoa, where do I go to play this? This <laughs> looks, this looks just fun. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, if you guys don't mind, I'm just gonna sit here and play this game. <laughs> that's yeah. That that that, that would be the, that would be uh, ideal. That that's why I want to become a gaming streamer. Just play <laughs> video games and make money. Yeah, that um, sounds nice. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's so, really cool. so that's that's pretty much it from the from the user end. Uh, you can see you can, you can run multiple apps at a time. Uh, you can resume and delete them. Um, but uh, and it looks back, like that opened it opened the instance and it has a one hour timer. So if you leave, you can still reopen that for one hour. And if not, then it, it will just kind of destroy it. Yeah. So I've I've got default settings on here, uh, which is by default it's going to automatically uh, delete that container in an hour. But that's that's configurable by the administrator. Gosh, this is really cool. This is really cool. So you asked about how developers would use this. And there's, um, as you see right now, I'm using the platform directly. So you can use the platform directly to do uh, a lot of use cases like remote work and, and, and um, browser isolation. But if I was a developer and I wanted to use this to power your own custom uh, software, there's two ways to, to go about it. The easiest way is casting, which is really cool. Uh, it's it's a simple, a very simple configuration. All you're doing is create a random URL um, and say, if somebody goes to this URL, launch this image, um, allow anonymous users so they don't have to log in. You can you can force log in um, <laughs> and uh, tell, tell it where to send the user with the inside browser. So I'm just going to, Oh, I can't show that off because I'm I'm streaming this particular uh, um, browser you tab. But send send it to me. Let's see. S send it to me real quick. Just send it in the private chat on on a uh, on on Streamyard, and I'll go to it real quick and I'll share my screen. You you are brave um, doing this uh, <laughs> live um, demo. Let's okay, uh, there it is. So let's. I'm gonna pull my my browser up here now. I'm gonna paste that in here. Boom. Ayo, load, loading Chromium mm -hmm. browser, and now it should take me to arm.com, and there it is. So now I'm on a uh, a container hosted by Chasm, SaaS, and that is that's showing me arm.com. So now basically I'm I'm kind of freely visiting and all, the, 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 there's not much latency here just to let you know I mean you can feel it a little bit but not much so yeah and that's actually on that's running on the east coast so oh there um, you go <laughs> yeah so for it, for it to be running uh, three time zones away from me this is pretty good
Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. look at that. Click. Let's go to, let's go to uh, solutions. Infrastructure is the best. There we go. Boom. Look at that. All right, cool. I like this. That's awesome. We did it. All right. Let's bring you back up here. All right. So that's the easiest way. And you can put, you could drop that in an iframe. Um, it's, you know, that's the, the dead simple way. The, the next way is we have a developer API and much like AWS or any other cloud provider, um, this developer API gives you a API key and a secret that you can then use to call our APIs. And, so, uh, oh, go ahead. I was going to say a question popped up here while you're on the web GUI. Um, does the web, does the web GUI have any performance metrics about the running containers? That sure does. Um, so we have this built in dashboard and this dashboard works well uh, for smaller deployments. Let's say um, a couple hundred concurrent sessions um, would be fine or smaller. And this gives you metrics on, uh, let's say, each agent. So an agent is raw compute. Uh, so this is where the containers get provisioned. Think of it as a, a kind of like a Kubernetes cluster. Um, so this, I only have one agent on this deployment, um, but you could you would have many, and you would be able to drill in and see your performance metrics on them. Um, also, you'll be able to see what users are doing. Uh, nice. But we do support uh, enterprise logging. So we support sending the logs to Splunk or other devices like that, where you could have dashboards set up to do even more thorough um, dashboards. There you go. I'm pretty sure that answers your question there, Charlie. Cool. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Please, please continue. Yeah. So um, kind of the next thing I wanted to talk about on the platform as it relates to more of the developer crowd would be uh, our support for different um uh, cloud environments. So we have this concept of zones and, and zones can be used for really any concept. Uh, for example, you might use it for uh, regions uh, like US East I have here in the example. Um, so you want to be able to have different regions of uh, compute clusters um, or might be used for the uh, security context uh, because in the, in the group settings, you can restrict people to different zones or images to zones. Uh, but in the zone settings is where you would enable auto scaling. And then this is where you would um, configure the auto scaling. Now you see we currently support AWS Digital Ocean and Oracle. Uh, GCP is in beta. Uh, and then we have Azure lined up as well. And so if I, I click that on, you can see there's all kinds of settings that you would set um, to support auto scaling in AWS. Very cool. Very cool. So um, now uh, I have here in the document it says if if there's more than fifteen minutes left, so there's there's we have about eleven minutes left here because <laughs> it looks like you covered the developer API, the customization, you casted, you kind of showed the demo here. We got to even part. We got to even use that cool link. Um, did you want to cover any of these other sections? We have the web filter, group settings staging yeah, zones i'll go uh through them real quick um okay staging uh you saw that stuff launches very quickly but some people want it to launch instantly so what staging does is it pre-warms containers um and assigns users to the containers on the fly um, the cool. next one is uh let's see web filtering so we've got a built-in forward proxy. So if you wanted to do web filtering and see where people are, are going, this is useful for the um, browser isolation use case. Awesome. Uh, in, a, in a more enterprise type environment. But so that, um, that basically allows the master user to monitor and see what's happening or just kind of not allow certain sites to be visited? Yeah, you can set up a, a white like whitelist or blacklist. Uh, gotcha. You can en enable URL categorization. So again, more of an enterprise type environment where they don't want people going to um, bad sites. Gotcha. At work, you know. Um, LDAP and SAML integration. So right now I'm using the Chasm's built-in authentication, but you can uh, use SAML or LDAP. 
Um, and the last thing I want to just, just quickly touch on is the group settings. So this is where you control, kind of think of it like group policy uh, based on if you're in this group, then these are the settings that are going to apply. And these are the images that I'm going to have access to. And it works in a hierarchy. So you can be a member of multiple groups. And based on the priority of the group, um, you see the administrators groups are priority of one. That's going to decide which colliding settings are going to take effect. This is rad. You know, I mean, <clears throat> I'm already thinking about how I might just use this just for you know, I, I mean, like people who watch this know I'm a bit of a crypto guy. Like when you're using cryptocurrencies and working on blockchain stuff, you know, you kind of treasure your anonymity in certain spaces. And, you know, as you mentioned, the VPN doesn't quite cut it all the time. And so, you know, you're always exploring new ways, trying to find new ways to, to kind of retain that and make sure that everything you put out there, um, especially when you're, you know, creating new wallets and, and finding, getting your private keys moved from one place to another, uh, storing certain things, you, you know, you always want to make sure that your safety is, is always looked at. And so yeah, I, I can already see use cases for, for just the casual crypto user, you know, who wants to make sure that they're safe exploring the internet, doing things when they have certain things stored on their computer. So I yeah. think that this is, this is just awesome. Um, on, on another note, I'm thinking about, you know, when I have kids, I could just make the, I, I could build a little parental control system here where, you know, the kids can only use certain things, right? Whitelist, blacklist, certain areas of the internet. And, uh, and when they launch their little computers that I want to give them when they come of age, then they'll, <laughs> they'll be restricted by chasm. So yeah. that's cool. I'm sure that everyone out there that's watching is, is going to have all their own little use cases and things they could use this for, of course, the things that we've covered today. Um, but uh, yeah, that's really cool. Was there, sorry, you pulled something else up here. Did you want to go over this? Oh, no, this is just the, the, the logging screen. This is where you can view the web filter logs if you have it enabled. Oh, nice. Okay. So you can see if someone tried getting onto a page. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, no. All right. Okay, cool. So Matt, um, I mean, at least according to uh, my my doc here, we have one last thing to cover, and this is the development pipeline. People always like to hear what's next. What's Chasm doing next? What kind of cool stuff will you be releasing in 2022 or 2023 and beyond? So um, are you able to share any stuff you guys are working on? You know, that dashboard was pretty awesome. Things you want to add there or more anything? Um so we have got a lot of things in the pipe, so many things. Um, Kubernetes support, uh, people are demanding that, and it makes sense. So Chasm orchestrates containers by itself, but um, a lot of companies have so much money invested in Kubernetes, and so many engineers have um, you know, so much of their time invested in Kubernetes. So it really makes sense for us to be able to leverage Kubernetes to do the orchestration um, as an option versus using Chasm to do it. Um, Windows is taboo subject in our office, uh, but I will say it's very hard to just completely ignore Windows and I'll just leave that one at that. Um, we're working on adding antivirus to our product. So when you, um, when you use the product, you'll have this control panel and you'll be able to, as a user, you'll be able to upload and download files to and from the, the remote session, as well as use the clipboard uh, between the, the remote and local session. Um, and we won't be able to inspect that for, for viruses. And by the way, those, those features can be enabled and disabled by the admin as well. Um, and of course, uh, future refinement for ARM. So we're excited for Graviton 3 to come out and we're excited to continue to optimize Chasm BNC rendering tech to um, you know, that, that takes a lot of horsepower to run that and, and stream stuff to users. And so it's nice to be able to take full advantage of the platform you're running on. And so we're looking forward to, to continuing to tweak that. That's great. All right, cool. So up and coming from Chasm. Yeah, you know, the antivirus thing I think is really important just to let you know, like one, I used to have a Dropbox <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> with Dropbox, I don't know, so, you know, like, so, so whenever I download something like uh, an application, I usually save the setup file and I save all these different things. Also, you're talking back in the days of like, you know, when torrenting was kind of still okay. But um, 
<laughs> um, so, so I had my Dropbox just filled with stuff and I just poured stuff into it over the course of several years and some compromised file got into my Dropbox. And back when, when I was still into Dropbox, I'm still, I'm talking like five years ago. Plus I went back in there to retrieve a file. And, uh, and when I, when I linked the Dropbox to my computer, my computer became compromised because something inside my Dropbox was compromised and Dropbox didn't offer, um, at least at the time, they didn't offer any antivirus malware type software. So basically a file got into my Dropbox that I could do nothing with. And I could no longer link my Dropbox to my computer because there was no way to find out what it was because Dropbox didn't offer any way to find out what it was. And I messaged their support. They're like, sorry, we don't offer this yet. We might offer it in the future. I'm like, okay, well, I guess I'm canceling my subscription because my Dropbox is now essentially rendered useless. That whole account, everything on that Dropbox became compromised because I could no longer link it to my computer. So that one little thing basically lost them a customer, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, I mean, antivirus in some cases is probably useful. I guess it depends on what you're using, but yeah. Yeah, um, absolutely. Cool. All righty. Well, um, this is the end of the segment. Three minutes left. We usually go on now with a shameless plug. So uh, Matt, it's up to you. What, what would you like to shamelessly plug for the viewers who are still on the call and those who <laughs> might watch this on demand later? Okay. Well, um, our web code, go to our website, www.chasmweb.com. Um, up in the right-hand corner, you'll be able to click on uh, join and there you'll be able to sign up for the personal cloud edition where for as little as $5 a month, you can have your own personal disposable browser. There you go. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'll pull this up right here. There you go at the top right side. You saw it join, join, create an account, $5 a month right down here. Easy. If you're a professional, you'll pay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's really cool. No, I mean, uh, I, I'm, I'm entertaining this, right? Like death by micro cuts. I'm already on it. So Netflix, Disney plus Hulu, uh, let's add GitHub. Let's add five more dollars to that. I think it's, it's pretty cool. Um, so, uh, thank you so much, Matt, for joining us. We have chasm web here, uh, winners of the graviton challenge AWS graviton challenge, Matt here, CTO and co-founder of chasm. We got to cover, chasm a container streaming platform so um without anything else matt i'm gonna kind of say goodbye and close out this episode is there any last words you'd like to say uh, i don't have anything thanks robert thanks for having me it was a great one hour excellent it was a pleasure if you just hold on for one second while we close this out and uh, i'll see you in the green room afterwards all right absolutely excellent well big thank you to matt here joining us uh once again for a, a, an amazing innovation coffee brought to you by arm again if you liked this episode don't forget to smash that like button right down below the video hit that like button thumbs up it helps us out a lot if you want to watch more of these we go live every single thursday 5 p.m utc unchanging now you may notice i think a time change is coming up soon for u.s residents the time will change for us, but it never changes for UTC. So if you always go by the 5 PM UTC time slot, you'll always find us here, whether it's 9 AM or 10 AM Pacific time. Um, thank you. Hybrid. Very interesting stream. Now I need to go get chasm. Yes, you do go get it pro pro membership. All right. So, um, uh, yes, once again, thank you. Next week, we will be joined by Dara Graylish, who is currently at, I think it's still going on MWC mobile world Congress over in Barcelona. He's taking videos. He's doing some interviews. He's taking a bunch of pictures. He's stopping by the arm booth, stopping by the AWS booth. And he's going to join us next week to show us all the cool stuff that was happening at the conference. We'll talk about, of course, anything arm related that happened at the conference. And uh, we'll have a fun, fun talk with him. You know, Dara, he, he gets excited about, about everything. So it'll be a lot of fun. Hope to see you next week. And uh, once again, Matt, thank you so much. This has been Innovation Coffee brought to you by Arm. We'll see you next week.